five minutes break. Uh, how do I connect to that dock now? I could show my two favorite Jupyter notebook, what we are using, but probably not. Okay, something completely different. Uh, Uh, who of you was at the last knowledge week? Okay, four of you. So the last knowledge week I already teased a little bit about the blockchain and this talk is a little bit of a follow-up to talk a little bit more about the blockchain. I'm not talking about solutions, more about problems, but I hope you still like it. Uh, are you using the blockchain for something? I know that, yeah. <laughs> Comics from I think four days ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we also know this one. <laughs> Too much text. The fun is here. <laughs> so seriously, uh, there was a hype cycle. We have to use blockchain for this, we have to use blockchain for that. And we are a little bit of the downside of the hype cycle now. Okay, what do we actually use the blockchain for? Uh, so people figured out, no, blockchain is not always the answer. Uh, we have a new government. Have you read the program of our new government on page 320-something? Uh, Zukunftstechnologien, Chance Nutzen, Master Plan for Blockchain Technologies and Cryptocurrencies. Vorausschauenden österreichischen Positionieren, Förderung, Anwendung, Regulieren, Blockchain, 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 Blockchain. blockchain. So the new government thinks blockchain is an important technology and we have to be a leader in blockchains and there will be Austria competence centers in blockchain technology. Unfortunately there's only the ABC uh, competence center. I am from the other one, from the Joseph Russell Center for Blockchain Technologies and Security Management. Uh, we started about in October 2019 and we will be going for about five years. Uh, it's a funded research project. I'm from the University of Applied Sciences in St. Pölten, from the IT Security Research Institute, and our industry partners, so our founding partners of this effort are SecConsult, Capacity, and CBB. So, well, what's the point of a funded uh, research project? It's because Austria usually has small and medium enterprises, and we don't have so much budget like the Silicon Valley counterparts. So if a small company in Austria wants to try a new technology or try a new idea, uh, usually they can, cannot fund uh, new ideas 100% for themselves. So the idea is uh, uh, not to, don't do research in the daily work of what the, what's their business, but work together with a research institution that we have some wild ideas and try new things. And it's a little bit funded and they pay a little bit and everybody's happy together and we can try new stuff. So we are at the start now. Uh, it will go for quite some time. And to give you a small introduction, what is a blockchain? Uh, I took the text from the homepage of the Vienna Data Science Group, the Zen of VDSG, the Vienna Data Science Group is a non-profit association, etc., etc. Imagine saving this into a text file, which is 844 bytes. And we have to do some cryptography to understand uh, what's a blockchain. Uh, you feed this input data of a block into a so-called hash function. And what is the output is a fingerprint of this data. Here, this is a SHA-1 uh, hash function, cryptographic hash function. So if you SHA-1 this text, you receive this fingerprint. The 
that's all the cryptography you uh, need to mention. <coughs> but that's okay. Uh, what's the property of such a, a hash function? It is impossible to reconstruct the original data from this hash fingerprint because if you think a little bit about it, this was a lot of data and you get a little bit of data. How do you reconstruct from this little data the lot of data? That would be an impressive compression function and you would get rich. It doesn't work that way. So uh, from this you cannot go back to the original and it is computationally infeasible to deliberately create two blocks of data that produce the same hash fingerprint as output, except by random guessing. So you take one data block and another data block and you want to get the same hash output it doesn't work that way. You can basically only guess uh, what a hash function is broken, which in this example is SHA-1, which is already considered broken because there are already attacks to do this. There, it was already demonstrated. Please do not use SHA-1. I just used it because the hash is uh, relatively short and good for presentation. Okay. Uh, and another interesting property of such a cryptographic hash function changed a little bit in the input and you get completely different output, basically. So if you change one bit from O to N, it's one bit change. Uh, the output is basically something completely different. So the only way to do this computation is put the data in, do the computation, and look at the result. What is now a blockchain? We have one data block and we apply this cryptographic hash function and receive a hash value. Then we have another data block and we add to this new data block the hash value of the first one and then do the hash computation over it and receive hash value 2. Then we have another data block, uh, hash, uh, data block 3. We uh, attach the hash value of the second one and then run the hash over it and we receive hash value 3. So what do we get is a chain of data blocks and every new block embeds the hash value of the previous block. You get a hash chain. If you have been paying attention how a hash is calculated, uh, the order matters. If you do 1 and then 2 and then 2 and 1, it's not the same result. Uh, so we have a chain of blocks which are linked by hashes. We replicate the chain of blocks over distributed computer nodes, over many nodes, and we have decentralized copies of the data. What's the interesting property? If everybody has the same copy and someone wants to man manipulate one block of it, or beginning at the middle or just the end, uh, it's pretty useless because if you do one modification, all the hash values of the following blocks would be different. So if only one node changes something, the others would notice because they have all the same copies and one node has different copies and different hash values. So uh, all nodes can uh, recompute this chain of hashes and check whether everything is the same as the other copies. As a fun fact, I googled yesterday if we talk about the Bitcoin blockchain, as of now it's about 265 gigabytes of data. So if you really want to recompute the chain of Bitcoin from the beginning of Bitcoin until now, you can do it, but you have to download 256 gigabytes of data. Currently this is still work okay because hard disks are so large, but it's only growing and growing and growing and growing. And at one point in time there will be the discussion that how to cut this uh, short. The interesting problem is with a distributed blockchain is um, who uh, appends a new block of data to the blockchain. Imagine everyone in this room has now a copy of this uh, blockchain. Who gets to write the new block? No, no. Okay, let's play a game. Uh, what's the result of the day today? <laughs> Because uh, if somebody would have screamed not a correct answer, I would have said, you are the next one to write a new block. Because you solved the puzzle this first, this fastest, and 
by definition, we assume who is the best guy, who is the best calculator, can attach a new block to the blockchain. Uh, is this a good solution? <laughs> yeah, it depends on the blockchain. Uh, but to get, get back to the real world, actually, it's basically the way it is actually implemented. So, uh, modify the data in a new block to append to the blockchain until the hash of the new block is of a specific format. And the format is all the leading uh, hash digits are 0000. zero, zero, zero. And of course, uh, the more digits are required, the longer it takes to guess this, this hash value. So you have certain bytes which you can modify, and you modify it at random, and you try to find this one, and there will be one random winner who finds a solution. And of, if you do it in Bitcoin, they reward that you're the first one, you have mined the Bitcoin, congratulations. So this is the motivation. We observe this is a colossal waste of computing power. Uh, the fastest mining happens, of course, where electricity is cheap. This is not here in Austria. Uh, to solve an artificial guessing game, and it has no practical value except uh, who is the first one. And we're wasting very, very a lot of um, uh, amounts of electricity in Bitcoin already by doing this proof of work solution. Uh, if you're old like me, I'm old. Uh, you may remember, and this is not a new idea, there was already proposed uh, the system of hash cache uh, to prevent uh, spam in email. It was proposed in 1997, and I actually remember that in the whole. Uh, the idea being, if you want to send an email and deliver it in a, to a server, the server gives you a password result, <coughs> basically this one, and the client has to compute the correct hash, so it has to show that he's really dedicated to send an email and then only if you provide the correct solution the server would accept it. Yeah, well the server has a little work because the, the answer can be checked very easily and the client cannot send lots of emails because for every email to send uh, he has to do a lot of computing. Why didn't this solution uh, take off? Too <laughs> slow. Yeah. Imagine uh, 20 years ago, computers were a little bit more expensive and computers also got faster every year, every year significantly. So today, uh, we get the last five years, we got from Intel maybe 5% speed up and then we lost it again to Spectre and Meta. Uh, but back then, uh, really computers doubled in speed one and a half year uh, intervals and they cost a lot of time. So, one had a very quick solution and the other one had to really compute a long time. If you would do this today, uh, we have fast computers, but you still have the problem. Uh, a Chinese or Russian uh, bad guy who commands 100,000 computers, well, do some computation, no problem. But if you want to send an email from your mobile phone and do the calculation, you're limited by battery power. Mm. So we still have the Someone has really cheap com compute and someone has, uh, has really expensive compute. It doesn't work in practice. Okay, uh, what do we do if two nodes find the correct answer at about the same time? So if you and you find the correct answer at the same time and propose a new block, how do we solve this? Well, it's undecided. We say it's, uh, okay, add another block and the first one who adds a second block wins. The longer chain always wins. Uh, the problem is, of course, the chains of blocks become, I believe, there will sometime in the future. So the more blocks are added, the more it is that they, they will not change anymore, that this is really the longest chain in the system. The problem is, of course, if you append a block, you have to wait whether it is accepted correctly or it is changed. So. If you want a fast uh, addition of data of blocks in such a construct, you may be lucky or may be not lucky. Uh, and of course, the computing power problem. Uh, imagine if someone controls uh, 50, more than 50% of the computing power in the system. Statistically, this will be the person who will always find a new block and construct the longest chain. So there will be uh, some control I will add this block and this block because I will find the puzzle solutions the fastest because I have control of 
uh, the most computer power. Uh, if you are not in a blockchain like Bitcoin, which is globally, if you are only in a small blockchain with only a few participants, imagine how valuable your blockchain is to an attacker because only 10 people work together in the blockchain and one turns malicious and says, well, I, ran, I will rent some cloud resources for compute and I will be the majority provider of compute resources and then I will control your blockchain. So, the size of the blockchain, and if you do, do the proof of work like that, of adding new blocks, may not work. Cryptocurrency and blockchain, uh, let's use a distributed blockchain where the data in the blocks is transactions of digital currency between nodes. For example, Peter pays to VDGS, VDSG his yearly membership fee, and Zordon pays, and Rania pays, and then we spend it all on the catering outside. That would be, for example, uh, uh, the transfers uh, of the cryptocurrency and the blockchain. So we have the data block and transfers of monies from one entity to the other. And the r a random node appends new block with transactions. And as motivation, you probably get the cryptocurrency as a money. What is the problem with that? Uh, digital currency is also not new, it's also known for a long time already. You basically always have the uh, double spending problem. I have a cryptocurrency which is basically bits of zeros and ones, and I spend a little bit with him, and a milliseconds better I spend it with him. And how do you prevent that I basically use my money twice? Because there is no central entity, no central accounting, and theoretically, uh, can spend it at the same time. Uh, it is not like a real currency. If I have physical currency, I give it to, and I don't have it anymore. But if I give it, if, if I copy bytes to someone else, I still own the bytes. Um, yeah. Second thing is, uh, if the entities in the network are anonymous, the actual owner controlling an identity may be unknown. But in Bitcoin, the solution is, well, uh, we do, we do, you do the, the uh, entity is uh, basically a cryptographic key. But to prevent the double spending problem, uh, everybody sees all the transactions. So you don't know who is the owner, but you see who is uh, taking uh, Bitcoins and who is moving it from point to point to point and sometimes you can reconstruct what, what is going on. So it's not really anonymous, maybe pseudonymous, and there's research going on how uh, can you go back and uncover who is spending what. Uh, with cryptocurrencies there's also the I'm a jerk problem. Uh, what if there for some reason uh, some entities just do not include your transactions in the blockchain? We don't like transactions from, I don't know, China. I will never include transactions, uh, if, I'm, if I'm creating a new block, I will never in, uh, include transactions from China. What should they do? They wait until someone else uh, includes them, or if someone is lucky enough and solves a bunch of blocks, which delays the, the uh, distribution of new, new blocks to everyone. So this is the selfish mining problem. If you put data on the blockchain, does the data on the blockchain live forever? Well, we have a hash chain, and I just said in the beginning, if we change it, we have to recompute all values again. Um, what if there is some field in the blockchain where a user can store any data they want? And will some be, someone be so creative and include some data that is probably not legal in Austria? And if you, are the, if you have a copy of the full blockchain, then you possess illegal data, but you have to have it to recompute it, but you are not allowed to have it here in Austria. So, um, what do we do about this problem, malicious actors? And European Union GDPR, um, actually you may be required uh, by law, remove the data of some person from your blockchain. But we already had this problem, we cannot change the blockchain anymore, but, well, mm, 
there is also no way to enforce that all nodes that, that need to run the same software and protocol that implements the blockchain rules, but you're living in this country, you're living in that country, you're living there, and the update is here, why should the others immediately update? If there's a significant change in the protocol and they may be beneficial to some and not to the others, you cannot force everyone to upgrade, to run the exactly same software with exactly the same software version. And the smart contract on the blockchain. Um, smart contract is a computer protocol intended to digitally facilitate, verify or enforce the negotiation of performance of the contract. That's a story from Wikipedia. Um, if you put basically a contract on the blockchain with a code that should be executed, it's for everyone to see, okay, and everyone can execute it. But imagine if in the code there is an error, or someone notices an error and does not tell the others about it, and at the right time, at a later time, uses this error to divert funds to his own pocket, if it's a cryptocurrency. And of course, there's an, if there's an error in the execution of the smart contracts, uh, if there is a flaw, you depend on someone who is writing the blockchain software <coughs> and hopefully it, the result will not hurt you if you are affected by this flaw. So we use the blockchain for everything, or maybe not. <laughs> it's not that easy, right? Uh, let's talk about real life applications we want to put on the blockchain. Usually in transactions in real life, uh, there's a certain uh, level of trust relationship because if someone misbehaves, I can sue you. That's a very important point because it, re it reduces the maliciousness in the system. And if you think about it, if you go every day outside and you have to work with a lot of people and you assume you trust that certain things in our society works expectedly, uh, we, our society only works because we have a certain degree of social trust concepts working. So, getting social trust into technical trust is not an easy question. And also the, the people who favor uh, distributed anonymous cryptocurrencies, uh, there is a reason that there are uh, financial regulations here in real life, because over how many years uh, we have learned there is abuse of the financial system, there are a reason why there are the regulations there and banks have to uh, work according to certain rules because uh, they misbehaved in the past, etc. <coughs> so money laundering, tax evasion, etc. etc. Do we really want a completely anonymous cryptocurrency no one controls? Um, the mining reward in some systems now is the incentive for proper behavior but you shouldn't need a mining reward if the incentive is not getting sued, if you misbehave. Um, disputes about how the thing works shouldn't be solved by the opinion by a few unelected blockchain software coders. They live somewhere. There's a group of people who write the blockchain software and something is not working. They decide, well, we, load, we solve it this way, push the commit to GitHub, and that's it. They are unelected, basically. Uh, if you're part, uh, cause of a blockchain software should not be able to fork or re-architect the blockchain you use at will. If there are a lot of participants and then they decide, well, we change this, what do you do about this? You want a little bit of more uh, trust and legal framework uh, with a little bit of reliability. Um, also, on blockchain applications, we can think about it. real life applications may have a lot of data readers, but the number of writers is often small. For example, if you want to track who owns what parcel of land, there are a few official identities that transfer ownership of land, but there are a lot of readers of the data. So, do you really need to distribute the blockchain for that, or is the blockchain a good solution? And think about it. If we record on a blockchain real life observations of stuff or assets which are basically work uh, because they are rooted in our legal system and our existing um, trust system, is there really a need to do some virtual on ledger uh, entities, assets, and we have smart contracts that 
provide the, the linking how to work with these virtual things, it all gets very complex. So, uh, stepping back, we have what cryptography do we use for this blockchain? We need to de replicate the data over many nodes. This is a problem of synchronization. We have a core problem of how do we modify data that is on the blockchain, which is constructed to be unmodifiable to see uh, a manipulation. We have what is an identity or what is a participant? Is it a crypto key? Is there a real life identity attached? We need something <coughs> to implement this stuff. Uh, maybe not only in one programming language because there are more programming languages and everybody wants to interface this to this blockchain with his favorite uh, environment and please don't make it a competition of who is able uh, to waste more cheap electricity on doing proof of works for finding zeros <laughs> that's not very productive so it's all very complicated right uh, luckily, hey, I'm an academic researcher, we need more to do research on this area to find the real applications. Uh, this is the University of Applied Sciences in St. Pölten. Actually, I'm lying a bit because it looks like this now. <laughs> <laughs> this is the old building and this is the new building currently being built. Uh, so we are growing, this is a good thing. The bad thing is we don't have a lot of space, but next year everything will be great and we will be a campus in Berlin. Uh, we are growing because we have a lot of departments. I'm from the Computer Science and Security Department and we have now the Bachelor and Master IT Security and now the Bachelor of Data Science is running and probably we will also get a Master in Data Science and we have the Applied Research and Innovation in Computer Science Master and starting probably in autumn cybersecurity Security and Resilience. We are a little bit of an anomaly because if you think of an Applied University, Applied Universities usually only teach but don't do research, that's university stuff. Uh, but we have a dedicated research uh, Institute, IT Security Research Institute, because we want to teach the students new stuff and we want to be able to work uh, for, on, the, on the, what's, what's new and we have, want to, the students also have to do practicals and companies, we want to have the connections and the new research project. So the students are really what's current now. We have two, block, uh, two projects now, that's why I'm standing here. Uh, we are part of the ABC Austrian Blockchain Center because there are five areas and we are in the part of the Emerging Industries and Blockchain in the Industry 4.0. That's not my department, so don't ask me about it. Uh, what I already said in the beginning, I'm from the Josef Ressel Center uh, for Blockchain and Security Management. That's a separate uh, entity and that's basically the same text. So. Uh, research with uh, companies at uh, applied universities. But the really, really important stuff, if you did not pay attention to all the other slides, now take your QR code reader, go to a URL, because next week on Tuesday, uh, there's the Blockchain Summit, so it's basically a coming together of the Austrian Blockchain Center and the Josef Ressel Center, and in the afternoon there will be workshops, and in the evening there will be a little bit of politics, uh, so this is the la two large uh, research centers about blockchain technology will meet next week on Tuesday. And if you're a company who wants to do a blockchain project or just want to meet with us or talk with us or network with whatever your area of interest is, uh, you're welcome. There are still a few seats free in the workshop uh, at look at the homepage. Maybe we meet again Tuesday next week. I done so far. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Or drinks outside? <laughs> <laughs> or too late? Maybe the pizza is just digesting. What about digital identity on the blockchain? What do you mean by digital identity? Uh, so 
somebody's born in the country and somebody in the office, right, on the blockchain that is born, that, that's his social security number and so on, and those data are not supposed to change all the time. They should remain forever, and for that the blockchain should be the best technology available. But the more interesting That's the point, point. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's one yeah. of the question. Public, but by who? Maybe uh, there is the discussion uh, because the current blockchains are basically you write data on it and everybody yeah. can read it. Uh, there was the idea uh, everybody writes to the blockchain, but not everybody can read everything. Yeah, that would open up uh, a lot of applications for industry use. And yes, this is one of the topics we will probably look closer at. The kind of, kind of government blockchain, intergovernment blockchain. Yeah, yeah, basically, this one, on permission system, you can read this one, this, you can read that part of the blockchain. So everybody can compute that the blockchain is correct, but not everybody can decrypt all parts of the blockchain. So this was, some years ago, deliberately we had 20 areas of data within the government with the Bereichspezifischen Personenkennzeichen. I'm not sure whether this still exists today. Whether they, whether they said, okay, it's, the government can link it up, it's more beneficial than abuse of separate data pools, if you mean that by data pools. Not exactly, because I was actually talking about Center because they are the other industry 4.0 guys. They are the industry. No more questions. One of the most promising ways to replace the book in the world. I'm going to ask for the back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. to replace it with the uh, amount of memory you have because not everybody has so much memory. Now the graphics cards have gigabytes of memory. No, we can't use that either, so it's... But if you have a non a want anonymity, you have this problem and it doesn't go away. It's a hard problem. the concept is that if you have multiple nodes and everybody has a copy of the blockchain. Now imagine if one node goes away and comes back three days later, he has to sync up with the others to be all of the same state. Now imagine uh, somehow all the participants decide we all have the same state 
and we don't have to st start at zero, 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 but improve the protocol that we say we don't start at the zero point. Everybody was online, everybody had the same copy, everybody did the check. Our new starting point is here in the chain and we throw all the other old parts away. The problem again is everybody had possession of the data. How do you tell everyone, well, delete the old data? And how do you figure out all participants are on that and have seen up to this point? Classic so the distributed system issue. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think he's not asking about resilience of the data, but really marking a block, a past block, as a main valid transaction or so, like with a new block. Yeah. Of course, you could implement this also. The feature of the sites that the command that everybody has to agree on that as well. Yeah, 51% of the network. So there are all kinds of variants, and which one will really go into real world, real world application rules? Which makes you wonder why did they approve it in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mistakes happen. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you.